part one of the night the mountain fell the story of the montana yellowstone earthquake this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales the night the mountain fell the story of the montana yellowstone earthquake by edmund christopherson part one real shook august is a busy month in the exciting mountain vacation area that centers in west yellowstone montana and includes yellowstone national park the restored ghost town of virginia city the nationally famous trout fishing reach of madison canyon that runs through the gallatin national forest plus dude ranches and lakes in the parts of montana wyoming and idaho where the three states come together geologically it is a new area where enormous forces are still thrusting up mountains where volcanic craters still exist and where the heat of the earth still spouts its imprisoned fury through the geysers that have made yellowstone park's firehole basin famous at eleven thirty seven p m on monday august seventeenth nineteen fifty nine one of the severest earthquakes recorded on the north american continent shook this area it sent gigantic tidal waves surging down the seven mile length of hebgen lake throwing an enormous quantity of water over the top of hebgen dam the way you can slosh water out of a dishpan still keeping it upright this water described as a wall twenty feet high swept down the narrow madison canyon full of campers and vacationers who were staying in dude ranches and at three forest service campgrounds along the seven mile stretch from the dam to the point where the canyon opened up into rolling wheat and grazing land just about the time this surge of water reached the mouth of the canyon half of a seven thousand six hundred foot high mountain came crashing down into the valley and cascaded like water up the opposite canyon wall hurtling house-sized quartzite and dolomite boulders on to the lower portion of rock creek campground this slide dammed the river and forced the surging water carrying trees mud and debris back into the campground the campers who had escaped being crushed under part of the forty four million cubic yards eighty million tons of rock found themselves picked up and thrown against trees cars trailers the side of the canyon etc heavy four thousand pound cars were tossed forty feet and smashed against trees by the force of the ricocheting water and the near hurricane velocity wind created by the mountain fall other cars were scrunched to suitcase thickness and thrown out from under the slide and the water stayed held by the earthquake caused natural dam it began to flood the lower end of the canyon at the upper end big sections of the road that would take the three hundred people trapped in the canyon to safety crumpled and fell into hebgen lake cutting them off from the world outside when the quake hit summer alternate rangers fred tim and lamont herbold were on duty at the west yellowstone entrance of yellowstone national park they had just cleared a semi-load of presto logs as the truck pulled on through the gate the plywood gatehouse shook so violently with the lights flashing off and on that herbold shouted stop the truck you blank you've hooked the shack truck drivers jack and lyle tuttle thought the frantic way their truck was flopping around meant the motor had broken loose from the mounts driving into the park they were halted by huge rocks blocking the road renewed shaking with tons more rocks rolling down the mountainside sent them scurrying for the cover behind trees lyle took refuge in a tree where he later said the shaking seemed twice as rough when the quaking stopped briefly they turned the truck around and were happy to get out before more boulders blocked their exit in the confusion that followed when the first shock hit jerry yetter who operates the duck creek cabins near west yellowstone jumped out of bed and knocked on all the cabin doors to warn the occupants of the quake only after he'd finished the job did he realize that he was wearing no clothes at all 
his wife iris ran onto the front porch the porch dropped into the basement she climbed out got into the car and didn't stop until she reached bozeman ninety miles to the north just west of the duck creek junction of highways one and one ninety one the first shocks wakened roland whitman as it sent dishes and furniture crashing to the floor when he couldn't reach his wife's folks in west yellowstone ten miles south by phone he rushed his wife margaret and their six children into the car started out and immediately crashed over a thirteen-foot drop-off scarp that the quake had jutted up between his home and the highway on the night of the quake mrs grace miller a widow who in her seventies is still sprightly enough to run single-handed the hillgard fishing lodge cabin and boat rentals on the north shore of hebgen lake found herself suddenly wakened about midnight she didn't know what was happening but she felt she had to get out of the house she threw a blanket around herself the door was jammed and she had to kick to get it open outside the door she saw a big five-foot crevice as she leaped across it the house dropped from under her into the lake more crevices kept opening in the moonlit ground as she walked away from the lake rabbits were skedaddling in every which direction she said but her malamute dog sandy was so frightened he wouldn't even notice them after quite a spell of hiking in the nightmare-like night she found refuge along with about forty other people at kirkwood ranch which itself was considerably damaged but a safe distance from the lake she was safe there while next day skin divers alerted by worried friends searched her floating house for her body later next day she boated past her nine-room home which contained everything she owned floating on the lake i hope it stays upright she said my teeth are still on the kitchen counter right next to the sink when she arrived at the dam she greeted an acquaintance with i've been a pretty tough old bird but i wouldn't want to go through that again in a forest fire lookout on top of ten thousand three hundred foot high mount holmes in yellowstone park the first shock threw penn state college student david bittner out of his bunk by golly they'll believe me this time he said with satisfaction as he picked himself up off the floor several days earlier he'd phoned a report of substantial tremors but no one would take his report seriously charles godkin chef at the frontier and his wife ruth a waitress were driving home at eleven thirty seven we must have a flat she said as the car thumped and shook along the road when godkin got out to look the ground was bucking so strenuously that he could hardly stand up back at the frontier he found steak plates all over the floor in the establishment's walk-in freezer he found the floor covered with mayonnaise a foot deep at the emmett j culligan place dubbed the blarney stone ranch the santa barbara water softener tycoon spent hundreds of thousands of dollars building a refuge from the possibility of atomic attack ironically the main fault of the earthquake rammed through one end of his building's cement block foundation raising the ground fifteen feet twisting and cracking the whole one hundred and fifty foot length of the building ironically too culligan's spread was perhaps the only one reputed to be covered by earthquake insurance his caretaking family john and doris russell were trapped in their cottage and had to crawl out and pass their children through a chin-high fifteen-inch square window at the proud dude ranch parade rest where bud and lou morris capitalize on the area's superb fishing the shock toppled chimneys atop the massive log buildings and sent the guests scurrying outdoors huddled around a huge campfire in the courtyard where it seemed safer they felt bewildered and helpless as the ground continued to heave and writhe throughout the night for hours the shock continued at the rate of one every minute by morning the kitchen was a shambles like a cabin a grizzly bear had worked over dishes flour everything crashed to the floor the only thing to do was to clean it up with a broom and shovel lou morris said elsewhere throughout the earthquake area crockery and goods in glass containers were at a premium drug stores bars groceries were shard piled shambles 
after the quake the proprietor of the antique shop next to the west yellowstone post office took one look at the disheartening spectacle of his shop and took off the shop floor was strewn with a fortune in broken antique glass and dishware the ground just got up and bucked like a horse one west yellowstone citizen put it the only man who was enthusiastic about the earthquake from the start was geologist irving j whitkind of the u s geological survey who was living in a trailer on a rise to the north of hebgen lake above the culligans and parade rest while he surveyed and mapped the area when the first shock hit he figured his trailer had somehow broken loose and was rolling down the hill he charged out intent on stopping it from the way the trees were swaying in the absence of any wind he knew it was a genuine earthquake he hopped in his jeep and headed down toward the lake he saw the scarp that the whitmans soared off just in time to stop it's mine it's mine he shouted as he got out of the jeep and realized the full measure of his fortune his words will echo wherever geologists gather in years to come professionally his once in a thousand lifetime fortune in being on the scene of a major quake meant as much as discovering an unfound pharaoh's tomb would to an egyptologist at mammoth the old army post which is still headquarters for yellowstone park superintendent lon garrison was sitting up in bed reading when the quake hit his wife and daughter were watching t v when the big chimneys and rocks from the massive old nineteen o nine built masonry buildings began crashing through the porches and roofs we got out and fast we prided ourselves on being cool it wasn't for an hour or so that i remembered that i was still wearing my park service uniform coat over pajama pants every time there was a new tremor the coyotes abundant thereabouts would let out a fresh howl the phone lines to old faithful and west yellowstone weren't working the quake had taken them out the eighteen thousand people who were overnighting in the park when the quake began were on the edge of panic what can we do how can we get word out can we get out everyone wanted answers to these questions at once at old faithful eight hundred people were in the recreation hall enjoying a college talent program in the best entertainment tradition the m c played it cool continuing his patter while the park rangers opened the doors everyone exited in good order but there was to be little comfort that night everyone who'd made it to bed got up after the first shock at the massive log-built old faithful inn the timbers gave out loud creaking and popping noises as the structural torment continued we had to evacuate the building superintendent garrison said hot water from a broken pipe in the attic was running down the floor of the east wing half an hour later the fireplace and chimney crashed through the dining-room floor activating the sprinkler system the water damage was horrible a few hours earlier with the dining-room full the casualty list would have been gruesome as it was our only casualty was a woman who sprained her ankle leaping out of bed after the first tremor later in the week a ranger exhausted from quake duty skidded on a rain-slick pavement and went off the road we feel that god had his arms around us all the way the quake continued with special violence at old faithful evacuees from the inn sat out the night wrapped in hotel blankets in their cars and in the big distinctive yellowstone park company buses trembling with fear at each new quake at the new canyon village guests were reassured by the big-voiced man who in the midst of the turmoil marched up to the reservations desk and demanded accommodations for an additional two nights canyon too was the place where they say another guest left a note on his pillow for the chambermaid saying an awfully rough bear stayed under my cabin last night had an awfully hard time sleeping better tell the night man to do something about it as the shocks continued the summons to exodus was clear quake broken roads blocked all the exits from west yellowstone except the route one ninety one through idaho south to pocatello for the rest of the night it was bright with the lights of cars streaming away from the earthquake country to the solid security and comfort of the outside world 
trapped for trailer and tent campers attractive rock creek campground less than a mile from the mouth of madison canyon was a favored site so much so that it was full most of the summer season campers who pulled into the canyon too late to find campsites in the formal or improved area just pulled off the road and overnighted on any level spot they could find along the road two vacationing families the osts and the fredericks felt lucky when they found adjacent campsites at rock creek on monday august seventeen rev elmer ost who teaches psychology at biblical seminary in new york city and doubles as pastor at bethany congregational church in corona queens his wife ruth youngsters larry fourteen geraldine thirteen joan eleven and shirley six had been enjoying a leisurely camping vacation in the northwest the melvin fredericks family he's a biscuit salesman for b and b from elyria ohio included mrs laura melva sixteen paul fifteen and george whitmore fifteen who lives with the fredericks in elyria ohio while his folks are missionarying in brazil the two families met in columbia falls montana at the home of rev ralph werner who was a relative of the fredericks and a college chum of the osts they both toured glacier national park and were headed for yellowstone park and the black hills and decided to camp together the next night ost told fredericks that if you don't make it to yellowstone park before noon the campsites would all be filled but he knew of camping areas in the madison canyon near west yellowstone and not too far outside the park where they'd be more likely to find room the osts got to rock creek campground at six o'clock monday august seventeen found a site and stationed larry by the road to stop the fredericks the two families chose a small open area near the stream and pleasant evergreen trees at the east end of the camp near the entrance they set up camp ate together socialized and made plans to get up at six o'clock next morning breakfast on dry cereal and get an early start for yellowstone they swapped stories about their vacation joked about the bear that was supposed to be scavenging around the campground and decided to walk down to the highway where they'd be away from the trees and able to see the moon which lit the mountain behind them but the mountain that looked high in the south side of the canyon kept them from seeing the moon directly they turned in early at nine o'clock the two younger os girls mildly concerned about the bear decided to sleep in the car a nineteen fifty buick larry and geraldine and their parents all slept in their tent mrs fredericks and melva slept in their station wagon while the men stretched out in a tent every one was nicely settled at eleven thirty seven when a thunder-like commotion outside awakened them ruth and jerry ost shouted something about bears as they jumped out of the tent it's a cyclone mrs ost was screaming in half awakened terror as rev ost emerged from the tent the sky was clear the moon bright as rev ost looked up and to the west there were no clouds or wind but terror ran through the whole party as they saw tents swaying trees shaking as though torn in a violent wind then the aust's 1950 buick began to rock from front to rear as if men were jumping energetically on the bumpers the brake lights went on as one of the girls jumped on the brake then came a tremendous roar like several express trains passing through the camp the trees shut off their view of the huge seven thousand six hundred foot mountain falling of the huge boulders big as houses hurling down one side of the canyon and up the other a mile away throwing sparks and dust as they fell rev ost sensed the rushing of the wind and water trapped by the avalanching mountain and thrown back at the dazed campers at tornado speeds from under the slide hang on to a tree he shouted mrs ost ran for the car as she saw the wave of water coming larry was caught in the tent when the wall of water mud and trees hit them with such violence that it crumpled trailers and hurled the ost's four thousand pound car thirty feet and smashed it against a row of trees 
although mrs ost was holding on to the steering wheel the violence of the surging water threw her against the side of the car so violently that it made a pulp out of the right side of her face in the midst of the mud water and floating and flying debris larry managed to tear his way out of the tent dust from the slide obscured the moon and heightened the sense of tragedy and terror the tent was gone the deluge of water had jammed cars and trailers together the rocks had covered the side of a trailer where a family had been playing earlier in the day the night rang out with the bewildered crying out for lost relatives stunned like the others rev ost shouted for fran after hitting the brake pedal she jumped out of the car and scampered like a deer to higher ground he found jerry unharmed except for being wet and an injury to her hand sloshing through the water to his knees he found ruth still in the car after several minutes hunting and shouting larry he found his son soaked clad only in shorts the screams of the lost and losing continued a woman handed a baby to melva frederick saying comfort him one dazed man walked around crying out for his missing wife from the wet and dark came the cry of another woman calling out it's safe here hoping to attract someone to help or keep her company the ost women and mrs frederick struggled to higher safer ground when the frederick's men didn't show up ost left the women praying while he went to look for them he heard mr frederick's call for help for his son paul with a flashlight he borrowed he was able to see the difficulty the surge of water and trees had caught fifteen-year-old paul and pinioned him in a sitting position in the water with one log across the small of his back and another across his lap the ends of the log were jammed between a smashed trailer and the ost car so solidly they wouldn't budge paul cried out with pain as the two men tried to pull him loose the water kept rising as the men tried to pry the logs apart with sticks a two by twelve plank ten feet long even though full of spikes seemed a promising tool to pry with but with it they were only able to gain an inch or so further separation of the logs that held paul prisoner the men felt paul's and their own helpless panic as the water swelled up to his chest his neck his chin raised in a soundly religious family paul bravely faced the realization that he was gasps from death in desperation ost called on mel fredericks to pull as hard as he could not to care if paul cried or if they pulled his arms or legs out of joint in this last desperate straining try they found that miraculously they could raise him six inches the rising water had buoyed the trailer in their next few feverish tries they were able to pull him loose and helped him to walk to high dry ground one stranded group calling for help included a wheelchair case and mucking shoeless through the water they portaged him out chair and all george whitmore had a badly injured eye from running into a rope and it looked like it might lose its sight they all moved to the highway which was still dry a motley crew they were in pajamas or almost unclothed some shoeless by this time the water had covered their cars some of the wounded were taken by car toward hebgen dam away from the slide marooned without their cars in a strange shaking canyon prisoners of a night in which everything seemed mad somehow word reached them that their ordeal might not be over there was possibility that a dam several miles upstream which they'd never seen was likely to give away any minute they scrambled up the sagebrush hillside and built a fire on a level and fairly open site others joined the two families one group whose car hadn't been flooded so suddenly managed to save groceries a camp stove sleeping bags pans and a nine by twelve foot plastic tarp without worrying about modesty they dried themselves around the fire there were seventeen in the party it cleared and then clouds obscured the moon the ground kept shaking with almost every new tremor came sparks and puffs of dust and the terrifying crashing echoes of another avalanche across the valley and the realization that the valley side above them might go any time 
the air was full of dust and the sickening smell of mud and torn fir trees all through the night they heard the haunting cries of help help we're freezing from the grover malts who'd been marooned on top of their trailer and by this time were hanging on to a tree they worried about forest fires and sang hymns to keep up their courage at three a m there was a thunderstorm and a light continuing rain they huddled under the plastic tarp all twenty-one of them and wondered what would happen next an elderly couple the grover c malts a seventy-two-year-old retired decorator and his wife lillian sixty-eight of temple city california had parked their trailer at the scenic rock creek campground for a week before the especially beautiful bright moonlit night of august seventeenth there were lots of bears in the area and like many other campers when the first jolt hit them they figured that the bears were trying to get into their trailer no it must be an earthquake mrs malt said looking out through the trailer window the moon made it seem like daylight everything was going upside down an instant later their trailer was tossed end over end landing miraculously on its wheels then it seemed as though something picked the trailer up and hurled it into the water malt got his nighty-clad missus out of the trailer and lifted her on top and went back into the trailer to get sweaters or something it suddenly turned dark the moon disappeared in dust the water had risen to malt's chin by the time he got out of the trailer by the time he'd crawled on the trailer roof put on trousers a shirt and sweater and wrapped clothing around his wife's legs the water was beginning to cover the trailer roof and rising fast they prayed that the trailer would drift toward a nearby tree it did the first branch broke as malt grabbed it he barely had time to get one arm around the tree and hold on to his wife with the other when the trailer was swept out from under them it was horrible he said as i tried to pull the missus up the limbs kept breaking off i tried to grab higher limbs and cling to the missus with my legs the limbs still kept breaking off finally we found a limb that would hold we were surrounded by deep water through the night we hollered and hollered for help people tried to get to us with ropes couldn't reach us and yelled that we should hang on they were going for a boat while we struggled to hold on we could see the mountains sliding and falling every few minutes there'd be a terrific roar followed by more slides i thought the world was coming to an end it turned hazy with thunder lightning then began to rain as we clung to the tree with water up to our necks my wife slipped under three or four times the last time she was gasping for breath i managed to pull her out let me go and save yourself she begged if you go i'll go too i told her about eight or eight thirty in the morning they came for us in a boat it was just in time we couldn't have held out for another ten minutes the water was rising so fast that the rescuers had to move their truck three times before they could unload the boat at first when rescued we could see lights then everything went black we couldn't hear anything over the roar of the tumbling mountains we were froze stiff from hanging on so long we couldn't move our legs the men had to help us get into the boat in contrast to those who stood around and wondered was l d smith of greeley colorado who with his family was camped in a trailer at the beaver creek campground a couple of miles downstream from hebgen dam the loud noise and rumbling woke him outside the trailer he found the water rising the ground was shaking violently he didn't know what was causing it but his first thought was that the dam had broken the steep-walled canyon didn't seem like a safe place for his family as soon as the shaking subsided temporarily he loaded his wife and two youngsters into the car and drove away from the dam the collapse of which he instinctively felt was the greatest danger as fast as he could a mile or two before he reached the slide he ran into heavy dust still fearful of what the dam's collapse would mean for those trapped in the deep canyon when the slide blocked his path he turned off the road and drove up the north side of the canyon wall to a point where he couldn't get any more traction he then got his family out of the car and moved them to still higher ground 
later in the evening his family joined the osts and fredericks around the fire on the hillside about eight o'clock on the same gorgeous moonlit night of august seventeen the pearly bennett family of coeur d'alene idaho pulled their trailer off alongside the road on the flat at the mouth of the madison canyon gorge they didn't plan to set up camp just to rest for a few hours before continuing to the park they talked a bit with others camped in the same informal area then turned in pearlie a forty-three-year-old truck driver and his wife irene slept in the trailer the youngsters carol seventeen philip fifteen tom ten and susan five stretched out in bedrolls outside on the ground they were awakened a little before midnight by a loud rumbling noise they wondered what it was but weren't concerned enough to get up or move their equipment some time later in response to a much louder noise bennett left the trailer to see about the children mrs bennett was right behind him as she stepped out of the trailer she felt a strong wind coming up there was a great rumbling whooshing sound and as the wind reached hurricane velocity she saw her husband grab a small tree for support the wind swept him off his feet he hung on like a flag tied to a mast after a little bit he let go and was blown away she never saw him again she couldn't see her children except one flying through the air a car was blown by rolling over and over and she found herself swept along with the trees the rocks and water when i came to she said i was jammed against a tree with a log on my back i don't know how i got out i thought i was the only one of my family still alive then over the awful moaning of the boulders grinding and crashing and the sound of the tree trunks howling through the air she heard the voice of her son philip calling slowly painfully in spite of crippling injuries they dragged an inch at a time toward one another over the rocky oozy bed of the river which the huge slide had instantaneously stopped highway patrolman stevens who found them several hours later noticed how torn their hands were from this agonizing crawl that morning in the hospital at ennis mrs bennett told reporters they say my husband and my boys are dead but i have faith i know they will be found they already had been dead End part one part two of the night the mountain fell the story of the montana yellowstone earthquake by edmund christopherson this librivox recording is in the public domain part two outside world the montana idaho wyoming area where the quake hit is a big sprawled out area where it's easy to get the feeling of isolation when everything's normal the roads open the phone lines and lights working in one shattering blow the earthquake cut most of this area's access and communication big sections of the yellowstone park roads were blocked by slides and boulders the road north of west yellowstone was impassable big chunks of the road between the duck creek y and hebgen dam had crumbled and slipped into the lake causing four major breaks and several minor ones the big slide formed an eighty million ton block at the west exit of the canyon and at wade lake road breakup had immobilized another group of terrified campers for the first few hours after the quake one of the biggest problems for the trapped was to get word out and for those outside to get some idea of just what had happened at the instant of the quake the berkeley seismograph showed shock in the west yellowstone area the first man to get word out was amateur radio operator warren russell who operates station k seven one c m from his trailer house in west yellowstone who began broadcasting news of the quake at eleven forty three p m at eleven fifty another ham father francis a peterson of st anthony idaho contacted idaho state police who relayed the word to headquarters in boise and thence to the national warning system at battle creek michigan 
at twelve twenty five a m on the first detail report from the western section of the alert system it was reported that hebgen dam was demolished and that there were six feet of mud and water in the town of ennis when the quake hit at eleven thirty seven p m it awoke austin bailey resident maintenance man for the montana highway department at duck creek junction where the road takes off along the north side of hebgen lake and through madison canyon he noticed the light overhead jumping furniture moved from the wall the lights weren't working realizing that such a shaking would topple rocks onto the highway he knew that he should get out and clear the roads before the heavy tourist traffic got under way next morning outside everything seemed normal he got into his own station wagon to make an initial check started out and thirty feet later drove over the fifteen foot high scarp embankment the main earthquake fault that had dropped off between the maintenance shed and the highway shaken but not hurt he crawled out of the car aware that something was seriously haywire and that he had to call for outside help he went a mile to the nearest telephone it was out in the maintenance shed where the heavy equipment and trucks are stored he found the sixteen-ton rotary snowplow had been jolted eight feet out of its position the night before the radio transmitter in his pickup either wasn't working or couldn't reach the area highway department headquarters in bozeman the road when he managed to reach it was shredded by long cracks running along the length of the road he loaded up his family and started north to get the word out that they needed help on the roads in the west yellowstone area at the y he found an overturned cadillac that had flipped coming over a continuation of the same scarp that ran through his own yard driving carefully at times it was like straddling a grease rack he finally found a phone that worked at almart lodge forty miles north of west yellowstone highway district engineer george barrett logged bailey's call at one fifty a m the quake caught montana's civil defense director hugh k potter in bed potter a grizzled former montana highway patrol captain and helena's police commissioner had lived through helena's 1935 six earthquake this earlier quake had logged some three thousand recorded tremors killed four people and destroyed several buildings including helena's city hall potter wasn't greatly impressed by the somewhat diminished by distance initial shock and went back to sleep at one thirty a m the helena police rousted out city fireman ed cottingham and reported that fragments of information about an earthquake which had caused severe damage in the state were coming in on police radio at one thirty two cottingham called potter and they went down and set up state civil defense headquarters in helena city hall an arabic style former shriners building which also houses the capital city's fire and police department for the next two hours their life was a turbulence seething with rumors the steep-walled canyons and high mountains which obstructed normal police shortwave radio added to the problem of already disrupted communications in getting information out of the quake area trying to piece together just what had happened the damage and what help was needed was like a horror movie about the thing with the exact nature of the horror emerging through the confusion and hysteria in small clues and fragments at civil defense headquarters potter realized the possibility of hebgen dam's collapse bursting shattering breaking in the quake it's an unreinforced concrete core earth fill dam seven hundred and twenty one feet long built in nineteen thirteen by the montana power company to regularize the flow of the madison for downstream power generation its failure would threaten the tourists in the valley and the sleepy six hundred population town of ennis sixty-five miles below the canyon mouth conflicting rumors filled the air that the dam was destroyed by two a m the police and highway department radio frequencies were zinging with these and other unconfirmed reports leaking in about the plight of the dam and the canyon 
in helena potter struggled with a vision of a smaller reenactment of the johnstown flood in ennis if the dam did or had let go first patrol montana highway patrolman glenn stevens made the first probe up the madison valley after the quake in response to a request for help from madison county sheriff lloyd brooks in virginia city stevens and deputy sheriff dutch buell wheeled down to ennis arriving at about two thirty o'clock the telephone lines were out it seemed important to warn people farther up the valley of the danger they were in some of the folks had already fled one ranch family was still in bed there were three groups of sleeping campers they didn't argue or waste time when stevens suggested they get out they just left as stevens and buell proceeded up the valley they radioed in at frequent intervals that everything seemed normal they reported rock on the road at various intervals from twenty six mile hill on south to the place above hutchins bridge where boulders tumbling from rock cliff made the road impassable cabin camp operator otto kirby had got his people out but there were two house trailers parked farther up near the river stevens warned the occupants and got them started out they gassed up at kirby's ranch it was cloudy and dark at three fifteen o'clock stevens radioed in that the water was muddy but otherwise seemed okay and that he planned to cross the bridge and drive up along the river on an old road on the south side sheriff brooks tried to discourage them shouting via radio don't do it you crazy bastard the dam's broke and you'll get killed too come back it was this message which picked up on the other radios and relayed to helena sparked civil defense director hugh potter to order the evacuation of ennis with sheriff brooks warning fresh in mind stevens said every turn we got off that bench i thought we were going to meet swimming water as they moved up the valley they got the message that a couple of people had been killed in the campgrounds at cliff lake to the south of the madison so when they hit the reynolds pass road they headed that way they got there at daybreak about four forty five a m they found that a rock cliff had fallen across the road which ran along the lake marooning the campers at the campground they found two campers dead killed in a bizarre and gruesome accident the e h strikers of san mateo california were camped on an improved campsite with a fire site a picnic table and a place to park their car their three youngsters slept in a tent a hundred feet away the quake dislodged huge eight-ton chunks of rock and set them bounding downwards in a freakish crescent-shaped path tearing the ground and toppling sixty-year-old fir trees in their downward rush nimbly two of these boulders bounded over the picnic table stacked with food and landed square on top of the sleeping bags in which the striker parents slept it wasn't pretty stevens said but there wasn't anything we could do the rocks were too big to move so we went down toward the shaw ranch and got frank shaw to take his four by four truck up and move the rocks off them we drove back down to the highway to continue up to the canyon in the freshening daylight on the way down from the high bench back into the valley we could see a couple of trailers down the highway near the mouth of the canyon a fish and game commission plane flew over radioing something about an obstruction across the lower end of the canyon and having two or three hours to get the people out we had no idea what they meant we got to the trailers they wanted to know how to get out the next section of the highway was blocked with rocks and boulders we routed them across the river and out reynolds passway into idaho one of the guys said he thought there were a couple of people still alive across the river we got to the slide about five forty five o'clock the huge pile of millions of tons of rock where the highway used to be you couldn't believe what you were looking at somebody said something about a little slide little i said to dutch i'd hate like hell to see a big one the aftershocks that kept happening with rocks crashing down and dirt and dust blowing up didn't contribute to our peace of mind either but we didn't have much time to look 
we struggled across the river the slide had stopped the water but left a muddy ooze and some water lying around in pools as much as three feet deep we found mrs irene bennett lying in the rocky stream bed she was cold and shivering she didn't have a stitch on neither did her son philip who was lying near her both of them were bruised and bashed the bennett boy had a broken right leg shoulder etc we put mrs bennett on an old wooden frame canvas cot and started across the slippery river bed with her she must have weighed a hundred and eighty as we struggled through the slippery muck she kept apologizing for causing us so much trouble and told us about her husband and three other children the other folks who were camped near her and the tremendous spurt of wind and mud that threw them out from under the slide she told how she'd come to believing herself the only one of her family who had survived despairing she heard phil calling from a spot seventy-five feet away where the water had thrown him their torn hands gave the story of the agonizing effort these crippled survivors had made to drag themselves together over the rocky stream bed by radio we asked the fish and game commission plane flying overhead to go to ennis and get dr losey and fly him back and land him on the highway nearby we didn't want to disturb mrs bennett by moving her off the cot so we put her into a station wagon morris staggers who lives near by showed up with an old iron bedstead older than any one there and heavier too i'll never forget the struggle we had carrying the bennett boy across on it we took the bennetts up to where the plane landed on the highway and turned them over to the doctor returning to the slide area the increasing light made the slide seem even more formidable that morning working with fish and game commission etc we found all of the people mrs bennett had told us about except one like mrs bennett and her son all of these bodies had been stripped of their clothing and showed the effects of being beat to hell by wind and water the coroner said all five of them died by drowning we never did find mrs marilyn stowe wife of sandy utah elementary school music teacher t mark stowe whose body we did find she must still be under the slide i just don't care to go through any more mourning like that stephen said end of part two part three of the night the mountain fell the story of the montana yellowstone earthquake by edmund christopherson this librivox recording is in the public domain part three civil defenses puzzle at two a m potter called in montana state highway engineer fred quinnell don brown of the montana fish and game department and captain alex stevenson chief of the montana highway patrol to help sort out the rumors in the tense hours ahead at two fifteen a m george barrett highway engineer in bozeman radioed to helena austin bailey's report on road conditions in the west yellowstone area another report from a road maintenance man in the ennis area brought some word of a rise in the madison way downstream from the canyon when asked by phone jack corrett president of the montana power company said he felt it unlikely that the dam had gone out as a precautionary measure to protect communities farther downstream on the madison an immediate drawdown of meadow lake and canyon ferry reservoirs was begun at two fifty three bozeman sheriff don skerritt reported that through the ham radio net that was rapidly taking up the slack in communications he had messaged his deputy everett biggs in west yellowstone a short time later he'd received word that there was still much violent shaking in the area that the lake had gone down substantially and the dam was still holding associated press sent a man over to civil defense headquarters in helena at two fifty five a m to keep in touch with developments at three fifteen o'clock when out of the communications block came the cry it's gone it's gone it was difficult to keep the press from rushing to the phones and announcing nationally that the dam had collapsed there was no confirmation but the impact of the moment impressed potter to the extent that he immediately called the marshal george hibbert at ennis the first settlement downstream from hebgen dam and urged him to get the people out 
the sirens blasted fifteen times as one crusty old ennis evacuee ray tuffy coles put it they wake you up in the middle of the g d night with the story that the dam's going to go still the people packed up and got out in pretty good order of course there was some confusion one guy grabbed a flashlight and a thermos of coffee his wife got into the car wearing a coat over her nightgown and carrying a girdle she'd been sewing on that evening some of the evacuees drove over the hill to madison county's exciting historical county seat town of virginia city to wait out the expected flood but most ennis folks spent the rest of the night perched in their parked cars on a hillside overlooking the town like penitents waiting for judgment day rescue first medical doctor august seventeen was the first time that dr raymond g bales an active bozeman medical doctor had got to bed at a decent hour in weeks the tremors he felt in bozeman were strong enough to damage buildings on montana state college campus in bozeman recently bales had bought the fifty-room stagecoach inn at west yellowstone and he was concerned about the inn and its employees the phone service to west was out as the night dragged on the radio brought him the news that the west yellowstone was close to the center of the quake and that the road to west was impassable he chartered a plane at daybreak on the way to west he had the pilot fly down over the madison canyon the dust had pretty much settled so they could see the massive slide in detail just above it a group of people the aust fredericks smiths etc were waving for help the lake was beginning to form in the canyon behind the slide more people were standing near their cars and trailers halfway between the slide and the dam just below the dam was another caravan which included many station wagons on the dam spillway someone had spelled out o k s o s with pancake flour in big white letters and marked a big cross on the highway in a spot suitable for a helicopter landing dr bales realized that there were injured among those trapped in the canyon as they flew low over the lake they saw where buildings and big sections of highway had dropped into the lake on the usually clear surface of the lake somehow as a result of the quake thousands of logs appeared probably submerged logs shaken off the bottom there were virtually no boats visible at the stagecoach inn he found the staff huddled around a bonfire under the trees across the street where they'd been since the heavy tremors began cracking plaster in the building the exception was jane winton a nurse who managed the hotel and had bravely stayed on duty at the desk they gathered splints medicines whatever emergency material they could find and went to the airport the pilot flew to a field big enough to land on at the watkins creek ranch on the south side of the lake about two miles from the dam in walking toward the dam they found debris where the tidal wave had thrown it half a mile up from the shore the entire south shore of the lake had risen about eight feet after a mile's walking they came to a spot where people were dragging their boats higher out of the water they believed the dam was going out and at first didn't want to lend dr bales a boat but he finally persuaded them dodging the many logs in the lake made the trip difficult as they approached the dam jane winton was frightened at the big crack at the dam's concrete core just you keep watching that crack dr bales told her if it gets bigger you'll know what's going to happen if not you'll be telling your grandchildren about all this to reach the bank we had to land through a lot of debris that had gathered at the dam we went over the top of the concrete at nine dr bale said we were met by a girl who seemed to have more authority mildred mrs ramon green of billings montana a former nurse who was one of the real heroes of the disaster she told us that no one had been there and that they'd had no word from outside since the quake more than nine hours earlier mrs green had the injured there were sixteen serious cases in the back of station wagons two to a wagon except for one elderly couple who were in their fishing trailer 
ray painter forty six a service station operator from ogden utah and his wife myrtle forty two they were perhaps the most seriously injured she had flesh torn off her arms a crushed chest a punctured lung and hemorrhages from an arm artery her husband had deep lacerations over ninety per cent of his legs like the other injured they were suffering terribly yet not one of them was complaining as mrs green took us around and gave the case histories we saw what a resourceful job she and another nurse mrs fred donegan of vandalia ohio had done in the absence of drugs medications and even proper bandages we helped with the dressings we'd brought and the medicines for pain and shock we were there an hour to an hour and a half these injured needed hospital care and there were no plans as yet to get them out they couldn't travel by boat so we got in our boat and went back to west yellowstone to arrange for the injured to get from there to bozeman and to the hospital when the helicopters did arrive shortly after noon the first helicopter a two-rotor silver air force h twenty one from hill air force base utah took its first load of four injured from the dam at west yellowstone airport as arranged by dr bales these injured in sleeping bags were immediately loaded onto the floor of a converted b eighteen which had brought cargo to west and flown to bozeman there dr bales had organized a fleet of station wagons to rush them to the hospital for the care that was to save most of their lives civil defense wrap-up by three forty five o'clock the highway department was in full action major road repair help was on the way to get the roads open george barrett at the department's bozeman headquarters called spike narrance of the naranch and conda contracting outfit which was building a big stretch of road in the gallatin valley about forty miles north of west yellowstone and got their big scale road building equipment rolling toward west yellowstone and the hebgen dam area there was still no definite idea of the exact damage or the road blockage but they'd begun to suspect major damage to the dam the roads or both if the highway department couldn't use the equipment for road repairs the power company could for dam repair pilot ralph cooper took off in the fish and game commission plane at three forty five a m from helena to reconnoiter the madison area shortly thereafter quinnell and alex stevenson took off in the highway department's plane with daybreak came the first word on just what had happened at six o'clock the planes reported c a one as recorded in the highway department's log slide area forty three miles south of ennis white sign on the top of dam reading o k s o s road has gone into the lake on the roadside mountain has gone into lake on opposite side cracks six to eight feet across the road slide is estimated to be one half mile long and three hundred to five hundred feet deep water rising fast about fifty cars stranded in the area estimated a hundred and fifty to two hundred people the only way out by helicopter potter immediately called johnson flying service a pioneer regional flying outfit in missoula two hundred miles from the slide and ordered a helicopter for rescue work he also asked for helicopter assistance from malmstrom air force base in great falls montana a hundred and ninety miles to the north malmstrom's rescue copter had blown a tire the day before so they sent a jet to salt lake for a new one potter hollered for helicopters on the national alert warning system hotline how many do you need he was asked all you can get he answered in response everything flying amphibians transports in addition to helicopters started moving toward the quake area from the forty first air rescue squadron hamilton air force base in california the twenty eight forty ninth air base wing rescue hill air force base utah the thirty six thirty eighth flying training squadron at stead air force base nevada and the forty sixty first support group malmstrom air force base montana 
the forest service began moving in its well-organized rescue organization that morning under the direction of harvey robe eight of the forest service's elite smoke jumpers trained in first aid jumped in the canyon at ten thirty o'clock with rescue equipment under the leadership of al hammond when we made our parachute landings hammond remembers the folks we came to rescue asked us solicitously if we were okay the rescue of the people trapped in the canyon it turned out there were close to three hundred proceeded smoothly the ost fredericks and smiths all ambulatory if shoeless were helicoptered out to the highway on the innes side of the slide and taken in highway patrol cars to the hospital or to the dormitory improvised in the high school gym the injured who had been gathered at the hebgen dam end of the canyon were helicoptered out to west and flown to the hospital in bozeman working continuously throughout the day without provisions for meals etc the road repair crews barbered a shoe fly substitute exit road along the steep mountain side parallel to the shore where the road had collapsed into the lake by six p m they completed a passable road the state highway patrol registered the cars as they exited from their entrapment in the madison canyon when all the unencumbered cars had passed through the bulldozers helped pull those with trailers over the most difficult portions of the substitute road that night the refugees were welcomed to food and beds in the montana state college gym in bozeman within eighteen hours after the initial shock the last of those trapped by the earthquake in the difficult to reach madison canyon were on their way to safety the wounded had been rescued hours before as george syme information guide for the highway department and for the civil defense said that day any one would have been proud to be a member of the highway department the whole operation ran smoothly it was a tremendous example of government service in the finest tradition a demonstration of agencies working together to do an important job nobody held back they put in all the personnel and spent all the money needed to get it done when we knew lives were at stake forest service region one chief charles tebb said we didn't worry about the cost or what appropriation it would come from we just went ahead and did the job quinnell head of the montana highway department took the same attitude it wasn't until three days after the quake that anyone mentioned the fact that no one including potter actually had authority for much of the work they'd done it belonged to the sheriffs of the counties involved by this time the emergency job was practically done all that remained was to figure up the damage untrapped all through the night the osts the fredericks and others trapped above the slide shuddered with each new quake and then listened for the repeated thunderous crashings of the avalanches which echoed loudly against the canyon walls every fifteen to twenty minutes all that morning there would be another shock they were thankful that their families were complete fredericks nearly exhausted from his work in helping rescue those trapped by the rapidly advancing water above the slide tried to sleep but the excitement and uncertainty kept the whole group awake at dawn which came at about five the first of the many small planes flew over the canyon the light gave the group a clear view of the opposite side of the canyon and they could see how the mountain had turned loose crashing down onto the canyon floor surging up the other side of the canyon to a height two-thirds of the height of its original location and then shooting both up and down the canyon they could now see the mud debris and the accumulating water which had covered their cars and camp in the early light they used methylate and dressings from a first aid kit to treat the worst of the previous night's injuries the two dozen eggs somehow rescued intact in their flight up the canyon side fried with canned potatoes and served on bread plus coffee made a heartening breakfast the smiths who had fled the beaver creek campground at the time of the quake joined them making a total of twenty-one in the group a small orange and silver plane swooped low circled and waved its wings flew east toward the dam they took heart in the fact that they had been discovered 
half an hour later the plane flew over again very low dropping an orange streamer fastened to an envelope the envelope was torn open by a branch and the message floated down by itself with fresh horror they read it it said fire down by river bridge on ridge top get going it was signed simply ost hurriedly they looked around for smoke seeing none frightened trapped in a strange wild country with all nature seeming to turn against them they knew not where to turn in an effort to find out about the fire ost borrowed the hip boots a woman had given fredericks and started off in the direction of the slide the plane circled over him and wagged its wings an action he interpreted to mean that he was going in the right direction he continued climbing the muddy lower end of the slide the rubble the great cube-shaped boulders big as cars all mixed in with trees some stripped bare others still complete with all their branches on the slide he met two men walking in from the outside they told ost that the river bridge was fifteen miles upstream past the dam and advised him to keep the group where it was until helicopter help came the plain message about the fire was still a mystery it remained so for several months until ost finally got it explained the message had been one of several dropped from a plane by a forest service guy otto h ost in nineteen fifty seven to instruct a ground crew to proceed to a fire a couple of hundred miles from the madison canyon the streamer otto ost figured had been found returned and sent out without removing the two-year-old message the note from ost to ost was a powerful coincidence doesn't it strike you as almost planned rev ost said when he got the explanation at eleven thirty a m the two forest service smoke jumpers part of a group of eight who jumped farther up the canyon hiked in they had first aid equipment and food they reassured the group that a helicopter was on its way to rescue them shortly after noon the johnson flying service helicopter arrived landing precariously on the canyon side slope mrs ost and george whitmore the fredericks nephew both with eye injuries were the first two taken out the helicopter ferried them over the slide to a point on the highway where highway patrol cars sped them at eighty miles an hour where rocks hadn't made the road hazardous to ennis to medical care comfort and safety by the time the helicopter had taken seventeen of the group over the turbulence of an oncoming storm made the air so treacherous that the four remaining men walked up the canyon were driven to a safer landing point at the upper end of the canyon they saw the cracks and damage at hebgen dam the helicopter picked them up and they joined their families in ennis we'd lost our money our cars our clothes mrs fredericks said the red cross didn't ask any questions about whether we had any money or not they just helped they sent us to stores and got us all two complete outfits they told us to make any calls home to our relatives that we wanted to and they're flying us home we're certainly going to be ardent red cross workers from now on that night they stayed dormitory style in the ennis high school gym as mrs fredericks puts it an anvil chorus each snoring in his own language conditioned by the quake of the night before when the town siren blasted off at nine p m the quake victims jumped out of bed in alarm and hastily dressed even after the siren was explained as the regular nightly curfew signal mrs fredericks slept the rest of the night in her clothes i'm damned if i'm going to be caught in my pajamas again she said the osts moved up to the shermont motel in sheridan where mrs ost recuperated from her face and eye injury miraculously though the whole side of her face was massively bruised no bones were broken that saturday they were guests of the madison county fair at twin bridges on sunday the red cross flew them from butte back to their homes in new york the fredericks moved to the finland hotel in butte where george whitmore had treatment for his more serious eye injury every one was so wonderful a bellhop drove us all around showing us this exciting town the people at the hotel took up a collection and gave us some money you couldn't have better people 
the fredericks flew back to illyria that same sunday leaving george whitmore in the hospital for further treatment the irony of it all mrs fredericks said is that we still didn't get to see yellowstone park end of part three part four of the night the mountain fell the story of the montana yellowstone earthquake by edmund christopherson this librivox recording is in the public domain part four mystery who got it with the primary emergency rescuing the injured and freeing the trap contained there still remained the perplexing problem of trying to figure out just how many were still buried under the eighty million ton rock slide early guesses put the figure in the hundreds the infeasibility of moving forty three million cubic yards of collapsed mountain in quest of this gruesome total was almost immediately apparent aerial photos taken that next morning showed that the slide hadn't covered the improved portion of rock creek campground the section with five formally laid out campsites each with parking spot fireplace picnic tables etc but this didn't help much toward an estimate of the total buried because of the informal fashion in which both trailer and tent campers would set up for the night anywhere they could find a level spot fred brower of the forest service fire control division in region one headquarters in missoula spent quite a bit of time talking to survivors and others who might help to establish a probable total reverend ost who'd been camped in rock creek campground said that he had counted twenty-one trailers between the mouth of the madison canyon and the spot he camped the undertaker in ennis charles raper put his estimate at one hundred to a hundred and sixty brower found that marshal george hibbert of the town of ennis had been on a fishing trip in the vicinity of the slide area on monday august seventeen and for some inexplicable reason decided to cut the trip short leaving the area at nine thirty o'clock that night about two hours before the quake he guessed from his observations that there could be a hundred people under the slide guy hansen a west yellowstone fifth and sixth grade school teacher who was working that summer as a fire prevention guard for the forest service had periodically checked the madison valley campgrounds in one survey shortly before the quake he'd found five tents eight trailers and forty-two people in the rock creek campground in the adjacent unimproved area he'd counted another twenty-five people at noon the monday of the quake he'd helped police the improved area and found six trailers parked there at midday he did not check the unimproved area from his familiarity with the campground hansen felt that forty campers were probably trapped under the slide brower chilled as hansen told him that the occupancy could be higher if there were groups such as boy scouts camped there he described how often he'd found scout encampments at rock creek and how one scoutmaster had told him that this was a favorite camping objective for many utah scout troops while brower was trying for an answer as to how many others were working on the question of just who was buried under the slide mrs t mark stowe of sandy utah was considered a probable from the first her husband was washed out from under the lower end of the slide and it was logical to deduce that she had been caught under the rock mass volunteers from ennis butte virginia city and elsewhere walked over the rugged slide for days searching for any kind of a clue which might help they turned up everything from fishing creels camp equipment and souvenir pillows to kids shoes one slide walker found an exposed roll of film which was immediately heralded as a hot lead but when developed the film turned out to have been ruined by the water their findings were kept in a county warehouse in ennis much of it was claimed by those who escaped the debris so painstakingly gathered helped little in the search for identity the quest evolved into the painful job of waiting keeping lists sifting names from the moment the quake occurred and the fact that there were casualties became known phone calls telegrams and letters began surging in from all over the u s wanting to know about friends and relatives 
who might be in the area or among the victims the disaster service of the american red cross did a tremendous job through their teletype and telephone by taking over these inquiries and sending back information through the home service chapters don scarrett sheriff of gallatin county said one of the leads was a spaniel discovered wandering in the slide area the day after the quake the animal wore a salt lake dog license tag this seemed like a certain clue to the identity of some of the victims in response to scarrett's teletype inquiry salt lake police found that the dog supposed to be wearing the tag had been killed months before someone had hung the collar in a gas station subsequently this collar was put on another dog further probing developed that the dog in the quake area belonged to the ray painters of ogden utah mrs painter one of the casualties died in the bozeman hospital a couple of days after the quake scarrett who's like a quieter shorter version of keefe offer worked all that week and for months afterwards on the identity problem during the first weeks red cross volunteers and personnel worked around the clock to answer the flood of inquiries there were some three thousand of them they felt fortunate that no scout troops turned up missing these queries they painstakingly sifted sorted and winnowed down with tireless persistence they kept at it writing to the source of each of the thousands of inquiries to find out if the missing had turned up new inquiries kept coming in and still do asking about people that just plain haven't been heard from and their relatives or friends have thought of the slide as a possible explanation through tangible tie-ins like postcards letters the use of credit cards in the area just before the quake phone calls from the area they finally got down to a list of those highly probable as slide victims whose bodies will never be uncovered take the case of roger provost an official at the california state prison at soledad california he had been in touch with his office up to the date of the quake he was a methodical type upon leaving california he left a planned vacation itinerary stating that the family was to proceed from yellowstone down the madison river august eighteen nineteen twenty and twenty one and to bozeman etc several cards to friends and relatives postmarked august sixteen at west yellowstone montana stated that the family was at a trailer camp site on the madison river about thirty miles from yellowstone another family robert j williams and wife coy children michael seven stephen eleven and christy three of idaho falls had told relatives they planned on fishing the madison river they registered as visitors at the museum in virginia city on august seventeenth nineteen fifty nine and were not heard of again dr merle edgerton and his wife edna in their car and trailer were travelling with harmon woods and his wife edna who also brought their car and trailer dr edgerton kept in daily contact with his hospital in coalinga california up to the time of the slide he was last heard from on august fifteen giving the family's location as on the madison river outside ennis thirty-five miles from yellowstone the complete list of those who on such evidence are considered buried under the monumental madison canyon slide totaled nineteen they are sidney d ballard wife and son of nelson b c bernie l boynton and wife inez of billings montana dr merle edgerton and wife edna of coalinga california roger provost and wife elizabeth and sons richard sixteen and david one and a half of soledad california mrs thomas mark stowe of sandy utah robert j williams and wife coy and children stephen eleven michael seven christy three of idaho falls idaho harmon woods and wife edna of coalinga california the other quake casualties include mr Pearlie bennett and children tommy carol and susan of coeur d'alene idaho who along with thomas stowe of sandy utah were found below the slide mr and mrs e h stryker of san mateo california were killed by the boulders at the cliff lake campground mrs myrtle painter of ogden utah and mrs margaret holmes of billings montana died of quake injuries in the bozeman hospital 
the final montana yellowstone earthquake death toll stands at twenty eight civil defense and natural disasters natural disasters like the montana yellowstone earthquake are perhaps the best test of our civil defense readiness until the quake civil defense director hugh potter wasn't at all sure that he had an outfit at all operating on a short budget of twenty one thousand dollars a year with all of the third biggest sprawled out state to organize he'd set up at least on paper statewide and county civil defense groups he'd compiled an exhaustive inventory of state facilities resources etc complete to each minutiae as the number of aspirants in the state one million six hundred and fifty seven thousand five grain tablets and the amount of meat montana's abundant wildlife represented fifty eight million five hundred and seventeen and seven hundred and twenty five pounds including one thousand bisons four hundred and fifteen grizzly bears the alerts he'd organized weren't notable successes and he'd caught some hell from the higher-ups for not being current on the statewide alerts which are supposed to be held at least once a year our people just aren't too enthusiastic about practice alerts potter says frankly they feel it's a waste of time they're busy they don't want to play war a guy will say i want to go fishing or put up a hay crop or something but let a real emergency happen and they're right there during the first day ed cottingham and i were busy pulling triggers i realized then that the most important thing i'd done during my seven years as civil defense director was getting around and getting to know who to phone the people you can count on to get something done in an emergency you can get the heck of a lot done if you know the right guy to call there isn't a civil defense department that didn't check in right away to find out if they were needed we're especially lucky to have the u s forest service the big slide happened in the beaverhead national forest in our area their experience and constantly organized readiness to meet the threat of forest fire right now makes them an ideal outfit for any emergency forest service firefighting squads transport equipment and information about the area are all set up to move in a matter of minutes they're most adaptable to the kind of crisis the earthquake threw at us you can tell the forest service your problem and quit worrying another important outfit is the montana forestry department which is set up to administer and protect the state's forests its boss gareth moon is head of the civil defense's rural firefighting section we have a good mobile law enforcement outfit in the montana highway patrol the montana fish and game department men in emergency serve as an excellent backwoods force frank wiley montana department of aeronautics director and one of the real pioneer pilots who can still fly anything from a jet to a jenny took over our flying problems at eight forty five a m as part of a civil defense emergency plan called operation bulldozer set up by the associated general contractors jack marlowe secretary of the montana contractors association had completed a list and location of all heavy construction equipment in the area and reported that all contractors were on standby in case they were needed the state department of health was on the ball too they were moving in personnel to test water in ennis west yellowstone and throughout the quake area by nine the morning after the quake at nine fifteen word came in that the red cross was flying in emergency personnel from the west coast potter was thrilled by the offers of help that kept civil defense headquarter phones busy general keith r barney of the army corps of engineers called offering any help needed the governors of idaho and wyoming and three canadian provinces asked if there was anything they could do idaho's highway patrol actually came up and helped keep things under control in the west yellowstone area several search and rescue outfits called offering aid a combined army navy and marine corps reserve unit from butte gathered their medical equipment and ambulances and sped to the ennis side of the slide as a voluntary unpaid action there were offers from the crack mine rescue teams from the famous anaconda company mines in butte 
when a call went out on the regular radio for housing for the ennis evacuees several hundred accommodations were phoned in to a local butte station another abortive suggestion that men on horseback might be needed to search some of the impassable back country brought over a hundred volunteers in less than an hour a bozeman station was overwhelmed with offers in response to an announcement that station wagons would be needed at the airport to ambulance the wounded to the hospital nurses doctors national guardsmen skin divers they all called in wanting to help at great falls where the montana red cross blood bank was holding a regularly scheduled drawing when word came that they were flying blood to bozeman to help the victims so many volunteers showed up that the total exceeded four hundred and fifty pints and at closing time a hundred and fifty donors were still in line we had special problems distance from any sizable town was one i'd hate to think of the casualties if the quake hit a really populated area potter said the mountains which obstruct short-wave signals and set up all sorts of radio blind spots made it difficult to get any sort of ground radio communications going it was impossible from the ground to signal to ennis or to hebgen dam from west yellowstone the radio amateurs did a tremendous job of helping those first few hours they set up a standby network and kept it clear for emergency messages one ham father francis a peterson w seven r k i from st anthony idaho one of the first to report the quake loaded up his gear drove to west yellowstone and by seven forty five a m the morning after the quake had set up radio control at the otherwise radio less west yellowstone airport another ham harold l better w seven j p d of dillon montana handled emergency communications from dillon the day after the quake then flew his equipment to the west yellowstone airport to help out too the problem was complicated by the multiplicity of wavelengths on which the various civilian and military agencies were operating we discovered that the high frequency bands the civil defense uses a hundred and fifty megacycles are useless in mountain country especially in the daytime lower frequencies thirty four point eighty two and forty six point eighty six megacycles did get through all that day or so we relied on the highway department plane which was radio equipped to get messages across the quake area it stayed in the air all day the mountain altitude at the dam the elevation is six thousand five hundred and fifty feet presented aviation difficulties too smaller helicopters couldn't make it and some of the bigger jobs were tricky to fly in the less dense mountain air we had difficulty with aerial sightseers in spite of our announcement that the fields at west yellowstone and ennis were closed to all but emergency aircraft planes flew in from all over charter pilots flew in from as far away as arizona and did a brisk business in flying the curious over the quake area at six dollars a head including the air force ships during the first few days the west yellowstone airport was as busy as chicago's midway field with planes taking off and landing at the rate of one a minute with all the traffic over the slide area it was a miracle that we got through the first week without a crash but as a result of the quake we know that any area which has this kind of emergency will make out okay with the wonderful spirit of people helping and wanting to help aftermath among the cataclysms of nature none is more terrifying than an earthquake and huge slides like the one triggered by the madison canyon earthquake are perhaps the most dramatic type of geological change in one sudden spectacular moment changes take place that make us think of the tremendous energy released by atomic fission the earth's mass moves in a volume that rocks the imagination and its effect on the people who are near or in the path of nature's huge impulsive seeming change helps us to realize how infinitesimal we are before the forces and laws of nature in 1903 a 40 million cubic yard rock slide crashed down from the crest of turtle mountain onto the coal mining town of frank alberta killing seventy people 
but the consequences of such huge slides aren't completed when the cliff toppling cease take the case of the famous june twenty three nineteen twenty five gros ventre slide in northwestern wyoming forty miles south of yellowstone park an estimated fifty million cubic yards of rock and debris plunged down the steep canyon wall shot across the valley floor and rushed some three hundred and fifty feet up the opposite wall of the canyon before it settled back like water sloshing in a huge bowl nobody was killed when this slide choked the gros ventre river it covered parts of two ranches and buried six head of cattle but two years later in may nineteen twenty seven the water dammed by the slide pushed out a big section of the slide and the sudden wave of water and debris washed away the town of kelly wyoming killing seven people this kind of possibility was in the mind of army corps of engineers missouri river chief keith r barney as he and lieutenant colonel walter h Holgrief of the corps district offices at garrison dam in north dakota discussed the montana earthquakes action the slide represented a double threat to people in the madison valley below as an immediate effect of the slide the water flowing over a hebgen dam was stopped by the slide the formation of a lake behind the slide began the moment of the slide when it filled this two hundred and forty foot deep impoundment called earthquake or quake lake would exert an enormous pressure on the slide if the slide was composed of unstable material its collapse could in a repeat of the gros ventre tragedy bring death and destruction to the valley towns of ennis three forks and trident below the second and greater threat was the discovery that when quake lake filled its impounded water would lap at the foundations of hebgen dam and quite possibly undermine it releasing a volume of water seven times that of the earthquake caused reservoirs which could also sweep part of the slide along in its mad rush like the threat of a time bomb the rising level of quake lake and the increasing pressure of the water against the slide augmented by rumor kept the downstream towns in constant anxiety the army corps of engineers rushed into emergency action they flew in a fifty-man staff and set up headquarters in the stagecoach inn at west yellowstone the mines in butte were on strike and huge earth-moving equipment from the open pit operations along with rigs from other contractors worked around the clock to cut a two hundred and fifty foot wide and fourteen foot deep channel across the mile and a half long slide and armor it with rock so that the water couldn't cause sudden erosion of the rest of the slide before the water topped the huge natural dam on september ten water licked over the new spillway running into the river bed just below which had been dry since the quake to the corps great surprise severe erosion tore the downstream face of the slide to remedy this they launched another crash program to cut a fifty foot deep channel across the top of the slide it was completed october twenty nine the corps operations on the slide took a total of close to one million seven hundred thousand dollars of funds set up for such emergencies as a result the towns below the slide are safe from the flood threat the slide might represent end of part four Part 5 of The Night the Mountain Fell, The Story of the Montana Yellowstone Earthquake by Edmund Christofferson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 5 Living Geology Just how common are mass earth shakeups like the Montana Yellowstone Earthquake anyhow? Geologists tell us they're frequent, with a dozen or more major quakes and thousands of minor tremors happening each year earthquakes are the natural outcome of the fact that the earth while seeming substantial and changeless is constantly if most gradually in the process of change mountains are thrust up glaciers carve them down volcanoes pour out their molten rock rivers and floods scour their erosive paths sediments slide and settle 
the enormous masses which great internal earth forces have raised up to mountain height create counter stresses these forces build up for years sometimes for centuries or longer eventually something has to give when this happens on a grand or spectacular scale we call it an earthquake whether you're a connoisseur expert or not the spectacular nineteen fifty nine montana yellowstone earthquake was a butte geologists call it a textbook earthquake because it included nearly all of the classic actions or results which quakes are likely to cause it ranked right along with san francisco's nineteen o six shakedown as among the severest earthquakes on the north american continent in seismic measurements it rated seven point eight on the richter scale as compared with san francisco's eight point two it set up so-called tidal waves or seiches on hebgen lake there were at least three of these huge waves twenty foot high which overtopped the entire seven hundred and twenty one foot length of the dam by four feet eyewitnesses statements relate that the velocity of the tidal wave was so great that it caused the water literally to leap over the top of the dam it filled the small generating plant with two to four feet deep layer of rocks although the dam stood the quake caused several fractures in the core wall one of which showed a three to four inch separation and shattered the dam's concrete spillway the earthquake created three major faults with displacement on the red canyon fault running as much as twenty feet which stacks up impressively alongside the twenty six foot maximum displacement resulting from san francisco's quake these two earthquakes differed however in that the montana displacement was vertical while the san francisco's was horizontal according to the society of military engineers surveys from benchmarks outside the earthquake affected areas show that the earth in the hebgen dam quake area near hebgen dam has settled between eighteen and nineteen feet from its level before the quake it wasn't uniform though the quake caused tilting which showed up in the way the north side of hebgen lake had sunk eight feet while the south side of the lake docks boats etc were sticking eight feet out of the water the quake also caused many sink or more properly blow holes these phenomena are also known as sand spouts water compressed and forced up and out by quake action washes out layers of sand substrata the overhead surface areas naturally drop into the hole leaving a puzzling hunk of slumped ground separate from the normal scarps as big as fifteen by fifty feet in area the montana yellowstone quake sent seismographs jiggling as far away as new zealand it caused fluctuation of water level in wells as much as ten feet in nearby idaho a tenth of a foot in hawaii three thousand two hundred miles away and point zero one feet in puerto rico the huge concrete hungry horse dam near columbia falls montana two hundred and fifty miles northwest of the quake area showed measurable displacement as a result of the quake in remote seattle the diminished tremors were still strong enough to break loose the floating amphitheater in lake washington but by far the most spectacular effect of montana's earthquake was the huge landslide at the mouth of the madison canyon at the side of the slide a relatively strong and nearly vertical layer of dolomite rock supported a huge bank or mountain of comparatively unstable schist and kept it from sliding into the valley in the same way that a retaining wall keeps a hillside terrace from slipping downhill the tremendous shock waves of the earthquake fractured this dolomite buttress and some forty three million cubic yards or eighty million tons of rock timber and other mountainside debris cascaded off the slope hurtled into the canyon and surged up the opposite side carrying huge trees and house-sized boulders as if they were weightless hollow toys 
when this huge mass whumped down on to the river-bed it forced out the water and air trapped underneath at hurricane velocity the huge slide spurted mud air and water with such force as to send two-ton cars sailing through the air and to grind others to suitcase thickness against the rocks all this happens in seconds it would take eight seconds for the mass at the top of the mountain to fall to the valley floor twelve hundred feet below at the time it reached this point the mass would be travelling a hundred and seventy four miles per hour the time it took to zoom half a mile across the valley up the opposite canyon wall then split and flow three-quarters of a mile up and down the valley the slide lies one and a half miles long in the valley was less than thirty seconds the fact that timber from the face of the mountain is spread in relatively uniform fashion over the entire surface of the slide is interpreted to mean that there was little tumbling action that the slide moved as a single if shattered mass one important scientific controversy has emerged from the earthquake it relates to the time relationship or sequence between the initial shock the tidal waves or seiches how fast the huge quantities of water which overtop the dam moved down the valley and whether these slugs of water had rushed through the canyon in time to reach the site of the slide before the mountain fell the stretch of the madison running through the canyon is fresh fast water but normally it takes up to two hours for an object to run the sparkling seven-mile trout-rich stretch from hebden dam to the mouth of the canyon the big surges of water the seiches overtopping the dam could make it a lot faster there are two big related questions could the big surges of water reach the point of the slide soon enough and just how soon after the first shock did the mountain fall for the first couple of days after the quake the theory persisted that the slide must have happened quite some time after the first shock as late as five a m according to some theories but as the facts and the testimony of folks trapped near the slide the osts fredericks smiths and mrs bennett became available it was apparent that the slide must have closely followed the initial shock even if you discount the disrupted time sense of people under stress when a minute can seem like an hour and vice versa it's difficult to imagine that more than twenty minutes elapsed between the first shock and the slide according to one set of calculations big waves could have swept from the dam to the slide site in eighteen minutes or so although the quake caused much settling of the earth packed against the downstream side of hegem dam's concrete core the relatively slight displacement of the sod cover is interpreted to mean that all three tidal waves passed over the dam before this earth subsided and separated from the core thus the water would have begun its race down the valley before the heavy earth settling shocks hit the dam area those who support the high water at the moment of the slide theory point to the great volume of water damage way below the slide if the slide had come first it would have dammed off the tidal waves and prevented such damage they feel there just wasn't enough water in the river bed's normal content to cause the water damage done both upstream and downstream by the slide and they argue the mud and dust in the composition of the slide would have taken up most of the water normally found in the reach of the river buried under the slide there's further evidence in the numerous fish found high and dry on the flat along the river bank several feet higher than the stream bed most of them were small catfish-like chubs there were numerous trout and one eighteen-inch carp there is no place in the river below the pool at the toe of the dam where carp would likely be found also there was further confirmation in the fact that three of the specially made eleven inch squared timbers eight and a half feet long with notched ends and two u-bolts used as stop logs in the hebgen dam spillway were found below the slide some shadow was cast on this as absolute confirmation by the montana power company's explanation that stop logs have been lost from time to time before the quake 
those who in spite of such evidence oppose the theory that the high water reached the slide area first just don't feel that the water could have made it all the way down the canyon in so short a time they feel that it would have taken at least forty minutes for the big waves to traverse the seven miles they have some support in l d smith's testimony that in driving down beaver creek to rock creek right after the shocks he saw no such waves at any rate this is one argument that geologists and hydrologists will be batting around for a long time now you can see it's unusual when an event so spectacular as the montana yellowstone earthquake doesn't produce some exploitable possibilities and this one did the month after this august seventeenth nineteen fifty nine series of quakes the u s forest service which is a proprietor of the vast and tumultuous real estate on which the major portion of the immediate quake action happened announced that it was under way with plans to set up a geological area to help visitors get to earthquake interest points and to understand the tremendous earth forces which operated there they held the inaugural of the madison river canyon earthquake area the first of its kind anywhere on august seventeenth nineteen sixty the first anniversary of the quake relatives of the twenty-eight quake victims sat on the gigantic slide as they unveiled the bronze memorial plaque mounted on the huge dolomite boulder which had floated across the valley atop the surging debris this awesome and fascinating earthquake area quickly became one of the region's top tourist attractions with close to half a million visitors in attendance during each of the first two post-quake summers in spite of miserable to nearly impassable access roads this popularity is especially fitting because the quake that's on display here was essentially a tourist earthquake it happened in the scenic mountain area which draws a brisk vacation traffic from all over the u s and canada during the height of the tourist season and those who went through the adventure the thrills the terror the heroes and the helped the survivors and the casualties could nearly all be classed as tourists superb trout fishing has always been one of the area's most important features and understandably there was much post-quake concern as to how this would be affected when hebgen lake was drained to repair the quake-damaged hebgen dam montana's fish and game department poisoned the trash fish and stocked the refilled lake with millions of rainbow trout running in size from fingerlings to nine inches today both hebgen and quake lake formed by the damming action of the slide at the mouth of madison canyon afford top fishing either from shore or from boat quake lake has a made-to-order launching ramp at cabin creek where the flooded out road runs right into the lake in spite of the concern by fish biologists that silting from the slide would take the edge off fishing in the madison below the slide area it kept right on providing fishermen the top-notch action that had long earned its reputation as a blue ribbon trout stream that compares with fishing anywhere in the world today there are excellent roads to and through the earthquake area route two eighty seven south from ennis leads directly to the huge slide at the mouth of madison canyon here the forest service has built a surfaced road up onto the slide on top is the best advantage point to view the whole panorama of the mountain fall where it dropped from how in a matter of seconds eighty million tons of rock cut off the valley the sparkling blue lake it created and the open stretch of the madison below the canyon besides on the slide there are interpretive exhibits and the huge monolith bearing the plaque to the quake dead twenty-one of whom still lie somewhere beneath the mammoth pile of rock the relocated route runs eastward down the slide along quake lake and through madison canyon several forest service people staff the formally designated earthquake area during the summer season to help explain and interpret what happened here 
definite plans for the area include a formal visitor center and at least one first-class campground in the slide lake canyon area hebgen dam the dam that held straddles the upper end of madison canyon the road from here along hebgen lake to the duck creek y has been much improved over its pre-quake status the quake area is just as easily approachable from west yellowstone by taking 191 north 10 miles to the duck creek y and then driving west along hebgen lake near the y the big fault runs close to the road through the culligan ranch etc the magnificent reynolds pass road which runs south from its junction with the madison canyon road three miles west of the slide has become an important new route for the earthquake area the morning after the slide highway crews were at work on this alternate route which for two years substituted for the blocked flooded and destroyed road through the madison canyon and along the north shore of hebgen lake while the regular route between ennis and west yellowstone remained blocked with its exciting mountain backdrop this new improved road provides an enjoyable alternative which should be included in any circle tour of quake features in the spring of nineteen fifty nine as he tells it lemuel garrison superintendent of yellowstone national park looked at some bids for new housing in the park which included extra steel as a protection against the possibility of earthquakes heck he said we're not an earthquake area today yellowstone's famous earthquake has become an important addition to its already fabulous attractions the park took the quake in its stride by june one nineteen sixty in spite of road damage of two million six hundred thousand dollars and building damage of one million seven hundred thousand dollars resulting from the quake yellowstone park its roads and other facilities were ready for its normal summer rush in clearing a slide which blocked the road near firehole falls south of madison junction the road crew discovered one near casualty a bear the Bruin had evidently sought shelter in a hollow below the road shoulder and became trapped when the slide closed his exit. It was several days after the quake when the crew heard the bear's attempts to crawl out of his artificial cave. They lowered a tree trunk, still bearing branches, into the hole and retreated while the bear scrambled out word of the quake plus the initial belief that the epicenters of seven of the eleven major shocks were located in the famous firehole basin caused widespread anxiety as to whether the tremendous forces loosed might have interfered with nature's intricate underground plumbing which keeps the geysers hot pools and mud pots spouting burbling and burping studies by a horde of seismologists geologists and other earth scientists who swarmed into the firehole basin in the months after the quake show that during the night of august seventeen the hot spring activity in this area changed more than during the eighty-seven years since a park was created out of the mysterious steaming country which had been known as coulter's hell the scientist termed these changes as profound and far-reaching these changes in thermal features are and will be in years to come tremendously interesting the majority of these changes came with or just after the initial quakes the earthquake acted as a trigger to start eruption in hundreds of springs nearly half of them erupting for the first time in their known histories the whole place blew then subsided there was considerable juggling of the intervals and playing times of some of the better known geysers great fountain riverside daisy castle and oblong shortened the length of their eruption intervals but they play nearly twice as frequently as they did prior to the quake sapphire a minor geyser became a major geyser but has subsided to a status somewhere in between clepsydra geyser went frantically wild and has erupted continuously since the quake steady geyser just up and quit so did grand geyser giantess geyser located just across the river from old faithful habitually shook the ground in the vicinity every time it erupted 
right after the quake it blasted off and kept blowing for a continuous one hundred hours instead of its usual thirty-hour run the fountain paint pots became so active and spread so that they took over what used to be an asphalt paved parking area in the midst of these changing patterns old faithful goes on in much the same way except for perhaps a slight increased interval between blasts studies of fourteen thousand three hundred and seventeen eruptions were clocked with an average interval of sixty three point eight minutes the shortest interval was thirty three minutes in nineteen forty eight fifty one the longest is ninety three minutes measured in nineteen fifty five but none of these changes are static just when grand geyser having been dormant for five months was considered dead it moved into a sporadic blasting phase these quake caused fluctuations in thermal features plus strong curiosity as to the earthquake's effects in the surrounding area superintendent long garrison fields will make yellowstone's post-quake years bigger than ever about the author ed christopherson was a professional author and magazine writer whose articles about montana the northwest and other subjects appear in the saturday evening post holiday this week magazine mademoiselle reader's digest the new york times congressional record etc born in ohio he began his writing career in new york his introduction to the mountain northwest came through a season as a forest service smoke jumper after several years in new york he picked exciting and scenic western montana as the center of his regional writing activities christopherson went to west yellowstone they called it shookville the day after the quake he got first-hand accounts from survivors there and in ennis flew and walked over the slide and elsewhere in the quake area and since has spent months researching and correlating what turned out to be the night the mountain fell end of part five end of the night the mountain fell the story of the montana yellowstone earthquake by edmund christopherson